I knew that IDOS has a very rich IP portfolio. I mean, their, their projects are just great. Their IPs are very rich. But there is X3 as the first launch title for our studio is incredible. If you want uh, a great studio, you need great uh, game. So, and to uh, uh, have a great team, you need a great game. So it's a, it's a all, you know. So that's the decision we took at the beginning, you know. We want a strong studio, so we need strong franchise and we need strong people to work on them. So it's a huge challenge, but it's no choice. You, you need that. I think I wouldn't have David Emphasy as a producer if it wasn't for Deus Ex 3. It was that simple. He, in his, in his head, the equation was, if I'm able to be the producer of Deus Ex 3, I'm in, Stefan, whatever the risks. We started in May uh, 2007, and uh, we were uh, two. <laughs> it was uh, one year and a half ago now and we were two. And now we are in pre-production and uh, the studio we are uh, almost uh, 155 and on their sex we are 83. We wanted to work only on AAA titles, only on the next, uh, the latest cutting edge technology. But the two other points are really important for the development team. We want to work with reduced size development teams, we call them in Montreal, of 80 to 85 people. But in exchange, we give this development team a longer cycle of production of 24 months after the proof of concept. Because too many people here in Montreal especially were asked to develop a 36 months game in a 15 month period with three times the staff level of 200 people. And people don't like to work in those conditions. And IDOS Montreal really wanted to find a way to a new approach, a human approach to develop good games. How are you today? Very good, thanks. It's a big day for you today. Very big day, indeed. Uh, Deus Ex is uh, going uh, in front of the Green Light Committee for its uh, vertical slice meeting, so it's, uh, it's very important. Well, uh, recently uh, IDOS um, installed a new uh, Green Light meeting process, and every quarter uh, we have a group that represents finance, sales, marketing, production, and the different groups and every quarter we review the top two projects in the pipeline. And this time it was Canon Lynch 2 and Deus Ex. When the Brits or the French come to Montreal to see the uh, possibility of invest, they come here and they don't feel strangers. They come here in Montreal, they see that we're in America but we have a, a lot of values coming from Europe. And um, I think they know that Investing in Montreal, they will have a company that will share the same values, but that, that this company will be working at a very fast pace of North America. And I think it's the best of both worlds. Kind of nervous? I'm confident. Confident. <laughs> Excited. <laughs> no, it's going to work fine. It's going to work fine. I mean, uh, there's always stress during these meetings. But when you have confidence in your team and in the content, things will, uh, will move. to have the senior brass having this uh, emotional bond to the, to the game. And I think we just, we just got that. Okay, uh, good. Yeah, the, it was silence in the room, everybody was looking, the music was very well integrated. All the major features were well demonstrated. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, lots. But now I think people really believe into the project. They know where we're going at because Deus Ex is a complicated, complex game that uh, can reach a lot of people. And if it's uh, well made, well crafted, well assembled, it's gonna be a sky's the limit. Real pleased, real pleased. The team worked like crazy and uh, we're really happy. The pressure is there, uh, the expectations are so high, but what a better way to launch a studio with this type of uh, quality uh, project. 
Uh, I think once we found our team of leads, I knew that we were in very good shape. Uh, these guys were passionate. They really wanted to have the, the Deus Ex 3 the best in the franchise. They knew exactly what to do, what not to do. And uh, so I, I, my comfort level was starting to rise. But again, it's a long journey. It's, uh, it's uh, two years or more of development. You never know how it's going to turn out. But the pressure is there, the fan base, the forums, even eight years after the initial, the first one came in 2000, by the way, PC game of the year, nothing less. Um, we knew what happened in 2003 with Invisible War. We knew what to do, what to do, not to do. And uh, I think that the fan base is so active and passionate. They're very protective of their favorite game. Uh, we, I think we exchange on the forums, on the blogs. We are always uh, listening to our fans. We want to do a game that will please them and that will bring new fans to the franchise. That, that is the biggest challenge for us. If we have some pressure to create Deus Ex 3, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, big time. But uh, at the same time, it's a good pressure because uh, we know that there's something to do there. Uh, so, uh, a lot of uh, things to ex explore and everything. And it's a great franchise to start with. So uh, I'm really enthusiastic about that. But I know we must not fuck it up. It's a, a huge challenge, but it's pretty exciting. And, and we're on the right track, so yeah, it's a good good uh, uh, pressure. The third game is going to actually be a prequel to the original game. So it's going to happen about 20 years earlier. So there's a bunch of things that have to tie in in a way. We have a lot of freedom because we're dealing 20 years before the game. So we can create our own, uh, our own storyline, our own characters, our own universe in a way, but we still have to match and, and set up for the original game in the future. So there's a lot of themes that have to be apparent. There are some hints and, and intrigues that can suggest what's going to happen. Uh, and we try and look at it from that perspective to bring it all together. The goal really was to take what people are used to see with cyberpunk and try to give it a new spin. And that's a bit where the Renaissance comes into play. Uh, uh, let's give it our own flavor, you know, let's give it our own voice. Um, let's get away a bit from the kind of bluish kind of sci-fi look that all those movies have. And let's try to give it something, something unique, something a little warmer. And the, the, the fact that it's warmer kind of brings it closer again to this whole kind of Renaissance, kind of, you know, humanity feeling type of thing. So the first day of sex, uh, uh, the setting were in uh, 2050, 52 exactly. The second one was 20 years after the first one, so in 2070, mm -hmm. and we are 20 years before the first uh, Deus Ex, so in 2020, 2027. Well, the good thing about doing the prequel is that if you haven't played the game before, you don't have to worry about it. You, you don't have to suddenly become like, oh, what's going on? Um, but in order to find, if you have played the game, I think that uh, you're going to want to really explore all the areas in the game. You're going to look for those subtle hints that exist. You're going to read the, the emails. You're going to um, listen for those references to some characters that may not be central to our story, but were central to the, uh, to the sequels. Or, the originals, I guess. <laughs> My challenge for this game is to open it up and make it accessible to the casual gamer while bringing along all the die-hard, hardcore fans from the first one. I, by no means do I want to alienate those people. Um, we can't remake Deus Ex 1. It just wouldn't fly by today's standards. But I think we can respect what was done. We can, as I said, often pay little tributes or homage to the first one. And I think the player will enjoy that. I think it's more the spirit of the game. If we respect the spirit of the game and the way it was done, um, I think people will be really happy with what we did. Something that we noticed very early, like the first one, is always at night. It's constantly with a black sky and everything. And we obviously said, you know, the game is not going to be, you know, at night all the time. It doesn't really make, make much sense. And that was part of a very strong feeling in, in, in the first one. But, you know, we're kind of changing that a little bit. But I think really, I think the feeling of DSX is the fact that you're, you're, you're in cities most of the time, like in the city hubs and stuff like that. Then it's to kind of like get the, those very kind of expensive interior, you know, that you can that you can explore in like the, the corporate kind of, you know, technological, you know, kind of techno interiors kind of kind of looking places. Um, I think I think it's 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 really that. And then it's a bit kind of, uh, 
it's not only about the art, really. It's a lot about the sound. And you know, it's it was a very moody game. And I think like as long as we you know recreate this mood properly, uh, uh, it's gonna have a very good, very good DSX one uh, feeling. But you know, obviously with with a few new twists. The second one, uh, DSX Invisible One, uh, we, we played it. You know, we uh, analyzed it uh, as we did for the first one. But uh, is made is different, uh, and um, so why we focus on uh, the, the the sequel, the Death X3, on the first one? Just because we think that the first one has the, the pillars we want to use for for Death X3. We do our best to 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 to, to keep the, the the core experience of the Deus Ex uh, games uh, with Deus Ex3. So even the old Die Hard fans should be able to 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 feel home again. And uh, you know what? We have to do the the best we can for this one. And I think it's going to be a very uh, strong product. And after that, if some Die Hard fans uh, say that uh, we miss an aspect or another, we'll live with that. I'll just change name and change my face or something. <laughs> <laughs>The teaser of uh, X3 that was released in uh, November 2007, that's, there's a funny story behind that because um, the proof of concept was approved by the UK, if I remember correctly, on October. And we wanted to announce, because everybody, all the media was, what's your first project? What's your first project? And we couldn't say anything before the proof of concept was validated. So in November 2007, we set the date for our press conference, our second press conference, <clears throat> and we decided that it would be stupid to come in front of the medias saying, they well, on paper, we have those X3, thank you, goodbye. We needed to show something. But we were only four weeks from there. And how can you create a high quality teaser in four weeks? You know, sat down with my boys and you know, what, what do you want to do? Kind of brainstorm a bit about, about the direction and thing. And then we said, let's have like this, this image blast, you know, that, that we called it, you know, all those images went really, really right. It was not even a second and there's like, there's like 27 images, 20, 27, 28. And it's just kind of put a bit of, a, of our theme and uh, it totally worked. Like they, they stopped it one frame by frame and they went way beyond everything we, we, anything we ever thought of, you know? So I think that was a really, really good hit. Really good idea. We uh, we had a lot of fun with that teaser. It was uh, it was a real labor of love, and it was obviously our first step into the media, so it was quite challenging. And you really want to make sure you put your best foot forward. Um, for us, for for me anyway, I really liked the visuals that I had. It was a very interesting uh, subject to work with, and I think I got lucky in taking a risky move by bringing the original theme into the end. For me, it was kind of my goal in doing that was to kind of um, put at ease the original fans who were, I know, obviously a bit nervous, saying, well, you know, this game's going to be redone, and we all know often sequels don't live up to the first one. So for me, it was a, a way to kind of give them a little pat on the back, saying, we're going to take good care of it. I, you know, we won't let you down. And it hit a core, because I think two hours after the official release, game trailers picked it up. And I think within 24 hours, fans were starting dissecting the, the, the video clip and the blogs just lit up like a Christmas tree. We actually wrote a name on the, on the, on the little fetus and the little baby thing, which is not even from us, it's the, the 3D studio that, uh, that worked uh, Digital Dimension that, that did it for us. Um, and I guess, you know, they were just having fun in the studio, let's give it a name, and they actually placed it on one of the little techno tags that's on it, which is Emil. And uh, it, they went, the fans went ballistic. They actually found that there's like this French sociologist from the 19th century called Emile, and it's like they were linked it with the game, and it's actually used in the game. So the name type of thing. So we'll find a place for it. Deus Ex, in, as a genre itself, falls into the cyberpunk category. Now, a lot of people don't re recognize that. that. Uh, genre of writing, they would more likely be familiar if you were to say it's like the Matrix. Um, people understand that cyberpunk is the dark world f in the f near future. Uh, it's a dystopian universe where generally you have corporations that are more powerful than the governments. You have conspiracies going on uh, and all the hidden agendas. I think cyberpunk is basically a very rapid grafting of technology over kind of an unsuspecting society, if you want. It's not 
you know, I don't know, if you look at Star Wars or whatever, it's like totally, you know, an entirely different vision of the future. Cyberpunk obviously is a near, very near future. And it's kind of like, you need to see the contemporariness and people need to be able to relate to what they're seeing. Oh, you know, like the buildings kind of look like, like today. But it's kind of like as if, it, it's this very like rapid creeping of all this new, you know, layering of technology and, and a bit in a kind of like chaotic way type of thing. So I think there's a, a, a big part of that. There's a few things that's, that I try to tie in is one is there's, uh, I think it's been talked a lot about is, is the cyber renaissance in that it's, uh, it's got a very classical feel in a, in a very modern environment. And I think the music is trying to take those two and bring them together. In the first ASX, I think as it was far more futuristic, it's a very electronic score. Um, it's very, uh, it's very synthetic and it completely works. And this one, I think because it's 25 years earlier, it's a generation earlier, um, it's mechanical augmentation, it's not nano augmentation. So the music tries to kind of ex express that. So there's a lot more organic texture. What it is is that when we were researching, uh, you know, what kind of cyberpunk we want to do and all that kind of stuff, uh, and we, we dive into the subject of, you know, augmentations and kind of transforming uh, uh, biology and all that kind of stuff, uh, at one point, we kind of like start seeing a big link between, you know, the Renaissance and and a, a, a transhumanist era, which is, you know, basically cyberpunk, which is kind of augmenting uh, the status of the human beings and, and stuff like that with uh, with uh, technology. So if you look a bit, if you look at a, at a, I don't know, a mechanical arm and stuff like that, if you look at the sketches of Leonardo da Vinci and all that kind of stuff, you know, the anatomy studies, there's like a strong kind of, you know, visual link between the two. Um, and also during the Renaissance, it was kind of like this whole new. Uh, opening this open-mindedness, you know, compared to the to the dark era of the medieval uh, 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 period, you know, towards kind of replacing uh, 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 kind of society within nature type of thing. Before that, it was all about religion and all that kind of stuff, and now it was more about let's really start, you know, analyzing it and forget about all the the religious taboos and that kind of stuff. And a transhumanist era is a bit also that it's kind of like you know today we still have problems with cloning stem cell research, well not problems, but I mean, you know, like some people are for it, some people are against it. So it's a bit as if transhumanism, it's the same thing, it's a bit letting go of that and really letting go of those taboos and, and, and trying to take control of our own evolution. On this score, I wanted to approach it kind of how the story is, is that the story is very much about taking something that's organic, like the human body, and then <clears throat> augmenting it so it's better than it was originally. So I approach the score the same way. So any acoustic instruments I've had have to be electronically either created or manipulated. So m most of the score is as virtual as possible. We're trying to do it so that every single instrument is done by me alone and virtually. So it was a weird approach, but I think it worked. At Eidos Montreal, we have a, a very interesting structure here. I am actually the lead writer on the project, but my title is the narrative game designer. So in a sense, I am in the game design field rather than in the writing field. Uh, I think it's very important. It's a new position in the industry, a narrative game designer. And my role is to work side by side with the game designers to ensure that as I'm developing the storyline, it's suiting the needs of the game. Um, so I'm familiar with what are the pillars of the gameplay that we're going for, what is the game experience that the game designers are trying to create, and I'm able to take that and create a story that works with it. One of the challenges of working in video games for a story writer is a story is a very linear experience and you're very much used to building an experience that you are in total control of you are guiding the, play, the, the viewer to feel what you want them to feel, etc. In a game, it's not a linear experience. The, the, the joy of a game is the freedom the player has to do whatever he wants, to be as unpredictable as he wants. And he might not want to follow your story. So one of the challenges, there's always that struggle between the game design and the story design, because the story may need you to experience this key event at this key moment, but you have no control whether the player will be there or not. Um, my job working with the game designers is to really find out where they expect and what they're building for this and find ways that the story can support it or go in different directions. The player can play the game 
uh, in various ways. He can mainly uh, choose the, the combat uh, approach, where it's all about using your guns, your uh, offensive augmentation. You can also to play it a little bit more subtle by playing it in uh, stealth mode. Uh, also, you have augmentations that you can choose that will help you into being a, a, a better stealth agent. Uh, we have hacking as well uh, that helps you to, to create new paths and uh, unlock new alternatives and also you'll have augmentations that will support that as well and for social you'll be inter able to interact with uh, a various cast of characters that you'll be able to try to convince them to do something for you give you information and again we'll fuel some augmentations that will allow you to be uh, better at convincing them so those are the, uh, the four important pillars and uh, what is really really uh, key to that is that uh, we want the players to be able to play the game the way they want and they, co they can go back and forth uh, through all those possibilities and, and, and tailor the, the experience to the, the way they, they feel it. Mesdames et messieurs, bon matin. Bon matin. <laughs> <laughs> si, on s'est pratiqué hier, là. <laughs> Today it's a very important day for the production of the game Deus Ex 3. Um, this is the Alpha Milestone. Uh, the Alpha Milestone, it's uh, about 15 months of work for the team. And um, the Alpha Milestone is simply that we will be able to play the to have a world through. Uh, so we'll be able to play from the beginning to the end of the game, uh, which is very important milestone for us because from this uh, from today uh, we'll have eight months to balance and tweak the mechanics of the game, and uh, it's very important for this kind of game because it's a mix of different uh, mechanics. Uh, this is a very specific recipe, uh, the Deus Ex experience, and uh, eight months will be the time we will need to balance and, and reach the quality we want for this game. Bon, ben, sur ce, je vous souhaite une bonne journée. On est alpha. Trois ans de travail. Trois ans de travail. Vous vous rendez compte C'est malade. Complètement malade. Donc là, il nous reste quatre mois pour la bêta. Si on est aussi rigoureux, puis aussi bien organisé qu'on l'est, puis motivé comme on l'est pour, pour l'alpha, on va livrer notre bêta comme du monde. So it's a very critical milestone for us, and we reached it. So it's a very good news for us. Bien fraîche, s'il vous plaît. Bien fraîche. Ouais. Voilà, ça peut pas être plus fraîche que ça. Merci, Alex. Cheers. Adam Jensen is the hero of the game. He's a uh, he's a private security specialist working at a biotech firm. He's in his late 30s, uh, and he has a bit of a troubled past in that he was originally a member of the Detroit Police Force. He was one of the SWAT team members. And there's an incident in his past that uh, he was in control of a, a SWAT situation. He was given a direct order, which he did not agree with, and, because he knew that it was wrong. He did not follow that order and instead someone else did and as he expected the whole situation fell apart he ended up being blamed and he ended up quitting that job uh, because of the the politics and everything around so we're starting with this hero who's got this background uh, he's kind of needing to prove himself to the world he gets hired by this biotech company and one of the very first things that happens to him is while he is protecting the company a group of black ops soldiers attack. Uh, and so from that point on, his quest is to go forward and discover who's done this and basically look for a redemption for himself. The casting 
for the game was a lot of fun. Uh, we originally took it from the standpoint of the first thing we have to start with is scripts. Uh, just audition scripts that won't actually be in the game. In the writing of these scripts, we, it helped us to discover the characters themselves. Once we had the audition scripts, we went in and we uh, worked with another company, Wave Generation, to bring in a bunch of actors. And it's a, a lot of fun to sit in an audition uh, system and, and have actor after actor come in. A lot of times you find that they're nowhere near what you want. A lot of times you find, yes, that's the exact voice. And sometimes you'll get an actor to come in and perform the character in a way that you didn't expect that makes you go, wait a second, that's the character that I want. I never asked for this. If you want to make enemies, try and change something. The year is 2027. When I first uh, got the role, I knew about Deus Ex, but I had never played it. And I went back and played it, and I was like, this is great, I can see why this is so popular, because I, I had no idea the popularity of it. And um, the second, and I didn't say anything, but somehow people found out I was playing the role, and it was just email after email after email, and I just couldn't answer them, I just wouldn't answer them, because, you know, they wouldn't, <laughs> they wouldn't let me. But um, it started mounting, and the pressure started mounting, and I started thinking, man, I hope, I hope this is good. If I had known what it was before, not that I would have played it any differently, but I would have maybe, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know, maybe I would have bowed out or something, because <laughs> I would have been terrified. Breaking news. The riots continue in the streets of Detroit. Eliza is the newscaster. She is a very hologram-type uh, character. Um, she's... Em well, they say that she's emotionless, but she does have something for Adam. She does develop a kind of a, a warmth and a, a, she has a soft spot for Adam. He is badass, I love him. He's, uh, he's, he's like, as far as you can go being a bad guy, but still being a good guy. You know what I mean? The choice of doing a, a character in, thir in third person and also in first person was uh, actually to um, create a better connection between the player and his uh, on-screen character. So when you only see him in first person, you create a connection actually with the gun. You see that the, the, the gun is the, uh, the star of the show. But what we wanted to achieve is actually to have the, the player see his own character sometimes when he goes into cover, when he does takedowns. When, actually, when he does cool stuff on, on the screen, we, wanted, we really wanted to showcase the, the main character. And this helps create a better connection with who you're playing, who is this guy that you, that you always see, you always see his end in his gun, but now you can actually see his face, see his reactions, see how he moves in the environment. So that was why we did that. And with all this augmentation, it's really awesome to see me mechanically how it's working. So uh, in the first person, it's not the same thing. You can, you can try to do a takedown in first person, but you will never have the, the feeling that you will have if you have the full body action and everything. So this is why we, we well, it's to showcase, because uh, we have awesome modelers, so we need to showcase. <laughs> we're not trying to go for photorealism. So because we're not trying to go for photorealism, it allows us to uh, change your proportions and stuff like that. It's not a, I wouldn't say that we, that they're caricatures. Uh, they're not like that, but obviously they're, they're a simplified version, right, of the, of the human bodies. Um, w one of the main reasons is actually, I do believe as an art director that by just replicating exactly the human proportions on screen, uh, it often doesn't look all that good. The hands look really small. You know, you, you see them in cutscenes and games, the fingers look kind of broken and kind of flimsy and that kind of stuff. Um, uh, sometimes, you no, know, I think the eyes need to be bigger to see the emotion and have a wider range of animation, that kind of stuff. So we're really going into that. Uh, we're simplifying a lot of stuff. Like, we actually think that, you know, getting all the pores in the skin is, is, is not necessarily what's important. Because if, if if the, the, the textures look really, really realistic, but yet the animation is still a bit, you know, like animations and games, I mean, as far as, as good as the animators are, it's, there's limitations, you know, and it, it, there's like a big clash between, it's like, oh my God, look at the skin, it looks so real, but yet, it, you know, it moves kind of like a robot, and we're trying to eliminate that by making them stylize a little, you know, the shoulders are bigger, the head's a little smaller, the hands are bigger, they, well, they look like comic book characters, basically, but I think done, done right. My name is Will Rosalini. I'm the CEO of Microtransponder. We're a medical device company developing wireless devices to interface with the nervous system. The idea of the $6 million man to enhance 
Um, human capabilities is certainly out there. Military has, has been more focused on helping soldiers get better. Um, so for the DARPA project, the $6 million man, uh, uh, the, at last count, the arm cost $100 million. Um, so they have a host of projects working with uh, rehabilitating the warfighter, and it's in the orders of billions of dollars in treatment for other cognitive disorders like post-traumatic stress or anxiety or tinnitus, for example. The question is, well, what exactly does it mean to be human? Which is one of the really interesting sort of subplots to this Deus Ex game is, okay, what does that mean to be a human, and how does that, how does that interface with our way of dealing with the, the world outside of us? See, it's a prequel. It happens before nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is in the game, like meaning they, they do stuff with it. They just they don't know how to implant it in, in the body yet, you know, so it's going to be using, you know, objects and stuff like that, but not for augmentations. One of the early things that we said is that we don't want to go the kind of kind of old school way of drawing uh, uh, cybernetics and stuff like that, you know, kind of like the chromey metallic arms with like, you know, wires coming out of the chest, plugging into the head, like it, it makes no sense at all. So I really didn't want to go for that. I wanted to, for something a little, you know, a little more subtle. The main thing was to actually generate a, a planned uncanniness, almost like a prosthetic. You know, when, we, when you look at a prosthetic, it doesn't look natural, but yet it's skin colored, that kind of stuff, and it kind of looks weird. So we're kind of aiming for that a bit. So you might have a, a, a guy that has a, a you know, a flesh-colored arm, but it's kind of, it's thinner, that kind of stuff, you know, it, it kind of bends in weird ways. Because um, obviously, if, uh, if your arm is mechanical and it's stronger, it doesn't necessarily need to be bigger. I mean, it's just mechanical anyway, right? So we're trying to, like, get into that. I was very disappointed in some movies, um, in part because they really just said, we're going to take a robot and put some human parts to it. And, and, and that's fine, but, but they could have done a lot more work. And, and a lot of credit goes to the Deus Ex team. When I showed up day one, they'd already read 10 times more than I would have expected. And over the last two years, they've become experts in and of themselves. And I think that kind of dedication to, to really to being scientifically valid in the sense that, yeah, this could happen, makes it much more interesting because it is closer to what could actually occur. And some of these movies that just put a big piece of uh, mechanical robotics up against some blood, that doesn't count. That doesn't count, you didn't think about it. And I think this team deserves a lot of credit for thinking through all those issues. I really think that the, the augmentations, uh, what they will be able to do with the main character, Adam Jensen, that will be just crazy. So, uh, and I know that because we did the focus test and it was just, you know, uh, high level prototypes, you know, and. Uh, or videos and they already say okay that's great. The idea that uh, the seven degrees of freedom that we currently have with our arms uh, is certainly limiting and the way that the, the main character can manipulate, uh, I, I'm not sure how many degrees of freedom the developers will actually uh, program in, but, but we're talking on the orders of 20, 30 degrees of freedom, that creates a whole different way of doing karate, doing self-defense, and doing attack moves. That's, that's really interesting. They did a great job with it. Um, and so that's what I'm most excited to see because I, I don't think any game has ever come close to delivering that type of uh, gameplay. It's really fun to have those augmentations, uh, but at the same time, it's it's something that we have to uh, we have to find cool ways to use them, and it's a pretty good challenge, I think. Yeah, we we try a lot of stuff like uh, Muay Thai, uh, <laughs> combat, uh, yeah, uh, Capoeira. Oh yeah, and and well, street kind of fighting stuff. But I think that we're going uh, to the well. Story wise, he's a uh, an old navy or a SWAT leader or something like that. Something like so, that. so uh, we decide to have something more military and and, and like quick, straight to the point. Straight to the point. It's not like you can just easily walk in a convenience store and just buy something. Obviously, so it's not going to be extremely widespread, but it is there. Uh, we're going into extreme details, really, like for as far as the heroes concerned and the bosses, like really into the mechanics and you see the things open and you, you, you really see how they work and how they behave. And I think, I think that's, I'm not sure that's ever been seen in game, really, that kind of attention to detail to mechanical parts and how they move and transform. It was a cool opportunity to actually get to, we're AI specialists, but then to get to work on a very special, boss battles are special moments. So two challenges, we had to take our tech and inject it into the DX3 engine. That was it. And then I think within DX3 itself is that, again, you're coming at it and you could be anybody, right? You could have this augmentation, that augmentation, this weapon. And so balancing all this stuff, you don't know a priori what 
the guy is coming into the game and you want to give him a great experience. You know, you want to be true to the designer's vision, but you want to give the player a great experience. So the balancing, that was brutally hard. The human claymore basically is, is exactly that. It's, it's, you know, you take how a claymore functions and it's, it's incorporated into uh, 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 the hero. It's actually an augmentation that you can go out and buy. Uh, and it's something that you can use when you're surrounded by enemies, you know, kind of like a last resort type of thing, and you trigger it, and he's got all those little latches that open in his body, and, and, and he literally, like, you know, ejects thousands of metal beads, and uh, he just goes into slow motion, and you see the enemies flying off in the air, and all that kind of stuff. Very, very cool effect. I think people are dangerous. Um, I mean, so technology, uh, technology is, is simply a tool, and, and I think that, that people are dangerous or not dangerous. And it's, it, it'd be very difficult to, in fact, impossible to stop the flow of technology. Um, you're going to get black market development regardless. So as an economist, first and foremost, I would argue that there's no need to stop any technology because the free market will take care of it. That said, there are controls in place that, that I think that we all could work on with, with clinical trials, with FDA, um, regulation of medical and, and drug products. That, that is an ongoing battle to, to make sure that there is a balance between aggressive development and marketing and safety of the, of the patients. We uh, launched the, the trailer, uh, the CGI trailer on the internet uh, one, pro one week prior to the E3 and the response was quite uh, absurd. Uh, we had, uh, I think, 2.5 million views in one week, uh, which is uh, quite enormous. This really created a buzz, a momentum for the, the, the code demo that we have shown to the, to, the, to the public. It was a labor of love of uh, over nine, 10 months, and was very intense. It was the first project that people from Visual Works, which is the studio of CGI of uh, Square Enix, it was the first time they worked on something else than the portfolio, the traditional portfolio of uh, Square Enix. So uh, we had, I think, the team of, uh, of uh, Final Fantasy working on this, and they completely uh, understood what we wanted to do, and the quality standard has been Totally awesome. You'll never find them. I'll never stop looking. Uh, we worked three years before uh, before showing our work to the, the journalists and the public and everything, and we uh, we showed the the the, the demo uh, to uh, 600 journalists in three days, and and the feedback is just great. So I'm very happy for the team. And what I'm really happy about is the uh, full reaction of all the territories. Not only uh, the North American media, but the European media is completely gaga. And uh, we have also, obviously, our friends from Japan that have really looked at it very seriously and they want to do a big launch in Japan, so that's a great news. When people come out of the demo and the trailer, they say, when is the movie coming out? <laughs> so now we have just a game to do. Uh, no, so that comment is very important for us because this means people have uh, emotionally bonded already to the game and they want to see more of it, uh, which is a great sign. But this is where it ends. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it and enjoy the rest of the show. We were supposed to take the E3 demo and to add a couple of things, the UI and some other things, but these guys are so, um, they want to show the uh, evolution to, to the media, to show the, uh, the depth of the game. And I think David and his crew decided um, very late in the game to, uh, to explore a new avenue for a new demo. And the demo that they chose really did hit the spot because I, uh, they Actually, can't. this demo was, uh, was chosen uh, roughly a month before it was come. <laughs> and, and that's no joke. And, and the real story is that we were... Uh, it is a joke. We, <laughs> it is a joke, but we did it anyway. It's a joke, but, it's a joke. <laughs> but uh, we were talking with the marketing guys and they were saying, yeah, maybe something new. Do you think you could show something else? And we were crazy enough to say, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
It's almost as if an E3 was like um, um a teaser. It, it, yeah, but it's almost as if this okay, like, it looks like a like a great game, you know, it looks like a triple A and, and things are there, but the the, the real Deus X answers were not fully answered yet. So it was like, yeah, okay, you guys are, are seems to be on a on a good way to make a great game. But Gamescom was really cool. We saw it was supposed to be a great game. Now we see it's a it's a Deus X, you know, the multipath is there, all the promises have been answered. What's going on over there? <clears throat> Warren Spector uh, was at the Gamescom. He was giving a, 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 a conference at the GDC Europe. And uh, David told me, you should, you know, text him to, to invite him to a private session. So I said, yeah, good idea. So I did, as I, I do some at main, main events, but he doesn't answer. But sometimes he shows up. And to our big surprise, he comes through the uh, Square Enix uh, booth around in the middle of the afternoon saying, I would like to come and see it because he never saw code. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did organize that uh, after the event uh, at 6.30, uh, 7, 7 p.m., a private screening. And it was quite special. I mean, we were in our demo booth. All of our guys were here and showing the third installment of the game that the father, you know, the, 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 the spiritual father was there. And uh, I think we took a lot of pictures. And uh, I remember one quote he said. He said, uh, it really looks and sounds like a true Deus Ex. And for me, that was, that was sufficient. You're gonna love Hangsha. Twice the scum and half the space. Call me if you need any backup. There's a nightclub in this sector called The Hive. If our hacker went to ground here, chances are the owner will know. These guys, first of all, they came because they came to the new studio. They left behind jobs that were incredibly uh, interesting, working for very good companies on very good franchises. But these guys left everything. What have we done? <laughs> <laughs> but these guys left everything to come to a brand new studio with not even uh, for, uh, permanent offices yet. And but it, they had this passion. Deep, deep passion, and I think for all of us, it's 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 the project of our life, yeah. and and we want this, this to be our signature. And uh, once you start with that, and you do, you work hard, you have good support, you have a good team, and after three years and a half, yeah. if if things are not so uh, so bad, the results will be there. Yeah, I I think it's it's exactly that. Um, I think really is it a great game or not? I, I think it's not up to us to say this at all. I think it's it's not a, it's not our business. I think it's it'll be the players and, and all that. But what I think it was really that it's it's a major major endeavor of passion. Like the journalists, like they come here. Like we have like journalists that have been in the business for 20 years, right? And and they come here and they tell us stuff like, man, I haven't felt that in like 10 years. Like the kind of spirit there's here, the kind of energy. Um, they're really like there's really something going on. Um, how much is that in the game? I hope, I think, I think that passion is in the game, definitely. Will that make a good game? Like I said, that's, I don't, I don't think that's really, I think we have a great product, but I mean, it's, it's a, um, but yeah, I think it's, it's really a work of, of passion and a, and, and a work of, um, of uh, I think like really, really smart people that like are really freaking structured, organized and stuff like that. And yeah, th th that's what it's all about. And it's a great team. And you know, we've been told that the games come, right? They, they were looking at all the pictures of, um, mm. of all the different teams of different dev teams and then when they got to our picture the journalist was like man it's like i couldn't put my finger on it at the beginning but it's like there's something about you guys and he realized your picture you guys are all kind of laughing and goofing around and and, 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 I, and i think that's that's yeah. that's what it is really it's a goofy game <laughs> Cut. if you want to make enemies try to change something 